Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. This week's guest is David Pajo. I've been wanting to talk to David Pajo since I started this podcast and I finally was able to make it happen and I'm super stoked. If you're a Gen X middle-aged guy like me with a big record collection, you know who David Pajo is. If you don't know, he's the guitar player in Slint, a band that released a six-song LP recorded by a bunch of teenagers in Louisville and released in 1991. There's never been a record before or after it that sounded anything like it. It changed so much about independent music. It's basically the invention of post-hardcore. Before hardcore had even really crested, like this was already sort of bubbling under the surface. It's the invention of slowcore. It was just a phenomenally influential record. The band had already broken up when it came out. Dave went on to play with uh, Tortoise and Stereolab and Will Oldham and King Kong and was in the Yeah, Yeah, Yes for a while, was in Interpol for a while. Just a guy who has played with tons of great bands and done tons of good work. And um, in 2015, he tried to kill himself. And we talk about that quite a bit. I feel like this may be one of the most important interviews I've done as a podcaster, and I'm really proud of it. If this is your first episode of Crash and Ride, Crash and Ride is a long-form interview podcast where I talk to musicians who survived anxiety, depression, addiction, trauma, really any form of mental illness or mental distress. I felt like if we could get together and have honest and open conversations, we could start to see some of our sadness in other people, and start to figure out what upsets us, and, and maybe start to get better. I am a professional musician, or I was before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, a lot of us were. Uh, a lot of us are sitting at home right now wondering how the fuck we're going to pay our bills. And I get that, and I hope you're hanging in there. I hope you're doing okay. I hope the Congress comes back and figures out some way to keep musicians and other self-employed people from starving to death. But in the meantime, if you're one of those musicians who's doing okay, uh, I'm doing okay. The podcast does pay us a little money, and um, we got a little ahead uh, in the last part of last year before things got really dark. And um, so I'm trying to find ways in my local community to help people. I'm finding GoFundMes to throw some money at. Uh, maybe you can do the same if you're not backed into a corner. And if you are backed into a corner, don't be afraid to ask for help. I think mutual aid is how we're going to get through this. I, I don't think we can count on anyone but ourselves. So reach out. If you need help, if you have help to give, find each other. Let's get through this alive. In that vein, I want to anonymously thank a listener from Seattle who sent me a MacBook Pro. Uh, regular listeners to the show know that my machine that I normally do the show on died a couple of weeks ago. I've been using a sort of doofer laptop since then, and it's uh, very old. It's 2008, I think, or 2009. And there's a machine in the kitchen charging right now uh, that just came in a box today. It's got tons of RAM and an SSD in it, and it's going to be the machine I do the show on from now on, at least until it breaks, which hopefully will be five or six years from now. I can't tell you what that means to me. It is huge because I was trying to figure out how not to spend you know, $1,000 on a laptop, and now I've got one to do the show on. I'm really grateful. Thank you. All right, a couple of quick announcements. Crash and Ride is brought to you in part by Greer Amplification. Greer Amp spills the best boutique effects pedals available. If you're looking for an overdrive, boost, fuzz, compressor, or tremolo that is rugged, road-tested, and at home, on stage, in the studio, or in your living room, Greer has a pedal for you. Nick and his staff strive to build the best products around with the best tone you've ever heard. They believe in their products, and they stand behind them, too, backing each one up with a lifetime warranty to the original owner. Each Greer Amp's product is hand-built in Athens, Georgia, USA. Go to www www.greeramps.com or visit your favorite music retailer today. Crash and Ride is also brought to you in part by Jittery Joe's, a local coffee roaster based here in Athens, Georgia. They have a special espresso blend named after the podcast. You can get Crash and Ride espresso, whole bean, or ground in cans from our website at crashandridepodcast.com or here in COVID-19 times, I would prefer that you get your espresso from my friend Seth Hendershot. Seth has a great coffee shop here in Athens, Georgia called Hendershots. It's a great place to read, a great place to write, a great place to study, a great place to hang out and meet your future ex-wife or husband. Um, it's also a really good place to see live music. All of those things you can do in normal times, but right now they only have patio service and they're not doing shows at night because it's too dangerous. And so, you know, they're just trying to make ends meet. However, at HendershotsAthens.com, that's H-E-N-D-E-R-S-H-O-T-S-A-T-H-E-N-S.com, uh, they have a web store, and you can get Crash and Ride Espresso there. You can get the Widespread Panic Coffee Blend there. They have the Kishibashi Blend, which is a dark roast coffee that's really delicious. Kishibashi, of course, is the great indie rock band from here in Athens, Georgia. And they have Hendershots merchandise, T-shirts, caps, stickers, stuff like that. If you go there and buy stuff, 
you don't just help Seth Hendershot keep a good coffee shop open. You also help him uh, employ like a dozen musicians and writers and students and really good people who work there. So HendershotsAthens.com. Get your Crash and Ride Espresso there. Get some widespread panic coffee there. Get some Kishibashi coffee. Spend early, spend often, and help save the Athens music scene. All right. David Pajo. I mean, I can't even begin to communicate to you how important Slint was to people like me. More than once, as I was carrying all my equipment into a studio to do a session, I turned to the engineer or producer and said, have you heard Spiderland? I want my drums to sound like that. That was just part of what it meant to be a musician in the early 90s, at least an indie rock, post-punk, post-hardcore guy. You you knew Slint. You knew Spiderland. But this was pre-internet, so you, you couldn't really know too much about the members of the band. So it wasn't until many years later that Dave Pajo sort of came on my radar as a post-Slint guy. He was playing with everybody. And and I sort of followed his career and thought, man, good for him. That guy made an amazing record and is continuing to make a living as a musician, and it's awesome. And then there was this incredibly dark, terrible night in 2015 where we nearly lost him. And it just showed me once again that there is no amount of external success that can make up for the shortcomings one feels internally if you're struggling. And I think that that's something we don't talk about enough. So so I wanted to have David on to talk about it on my show. Brad Wood, the astonishingly talented Chicago producer who now lives in Los Angeles, connected us, and we started emailing back and forth and finally got on the same page to get some time. I called David's apartment in Los Angeles, and we had like a three-hour conversation that I edited down to something manageable and digestible for the average podcast listener, but um, he's a lovely, lovely guy. And we talked while he made coffee and and um, and and sat on the couch while his cat fell asleep on him and had a really... Really good talk, and I'm really proud of it. I think one of the most remarkable things to come out of this conversation is that just about everyone who gets to the point where David was in 2015 thinks that they're all alone. And if this show accomplishes nothing else, I want anybody who listens to it to know that you're not alone. And many, many of us have been there. And you just got to get through it, man. Get to the other side because it gets better. Nobody called you Pat. I was already none of your friendship. Yeah, no, 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 nobody close to me does. Maybe once. Yeah. You know? I think it's, um, yeah, it's the people that I grew up with are used to calling me Dave, mm-hmm. but like I, I never changed it or just like from moving around people like newer friends started calling me David. So like I answered it either, but and now Dave sounds weird to me and like it's only it's only like my childhood friends, you know, yeah. like, that say that. Yeah. Um, a, one a, second. I'm sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hey, sorry about that. No, that's okay. I just had to make a coffee and it was kind of loud. Oh, how do you make your coffee? Um, it's like, uh, it's an espresso machine, but it's just like one, the one button kind. Yeah. Um, uh, I I got it when I first had one of my daughter was born because uh, I you know I'd have to wake up at odd hours and I would just want to copy immediately. Yeah. I just want to press <laughs> one button. <laughs> is it like one of those? Is it an espresso? Is that what those things are? Called? No, it's not the one that uses pods. It's yeah. uh, it just it like has a grinder in it and stuff. It's sort of like a small like consumer version of what they have at Starbucks. Like yeah. Um, uh, where they it has a grinder on top, and um, yeah, they just press a button and it'll make a, a double espresso. I, I mean, I, I like an espresso that tastes good, just without sugar and you know without anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and it should have like the what's it called the the crema, crema on yeah, it. Yeah. But um, I also I also really just want it to be medicinal. Like it should give me some energy. It should 
kind of kicked me in the ass a little bit. <laughs> yeah. We have the exact same standards for espresso. I realized on tour with, um, I was on tour in, in Italy once, and like after like 11 o'clock in the morning, nobody drinks milk in their coffee. It's like a five-hour energy shot or something, just bang. And yeah. <laughs> I came to really embrace that, but it has to taste good, you know. I'm a mocha pot guy, that like Cuban thing that goes on the stove, you know. Yeah. And you like dump, yeah, those are great. Yeah, once the like crema forms, you dump that out and over sugar and stir it in, and then you finish it off. Yeah, I think my my espresso addiction started when I did I did like t a two week tour that was just in Italy. We were in a, all in a van, and um, our Sicilian uh, hosts would stop like every half an hour to to like have a coffee which is an espresso over there you know so uh i i was more of a coffee drinker before that and then after that tour i was just like addicted to espresso like and it never changed after that who were you over there with um it was uh i was playing with this my solo band which at the time is called ariel m yeah but the my yeah the promoters also like took care of us and um like drove us around and, and to each show and some of the sh like because italy is not that big right. to spend two weeks uh playing shows in so like there was, we would play a show and literally drive like 20 minutes to the next show <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> so different from touring in the u.s i've had friends come over and bands from other countries and they're like yeah so we figured it was just since dallas is in the south and atlanta's in the south it wouldn't be too bad a drive i'm like oh god man <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That. Yeah. People get a rude awakening when they when they realize some of the distance. Yeah. But but also like um like touring in Australia, it's like you have to fly to different shows because there's way more space in between the cities. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's crazy. I have not toured in um in Australia. We uh, my band had an opportunity to go there. And we had this manager at the time who was like, you're going to leave the day after Thanksgiving and back, get back like a week before Christmas and you're going to be broke because the tour's not going to make any money. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah but, we'll, but we'll have gone to Australia. And, and he was like, I just think it's a bad idea. Not realizing that it was a bad idea because he wasn't going to get paid, you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, see, that sucks. I, yeah. I, my, my band Slint did a reunion, like, uh, tour like did a couple of reunion tours but like we were offered to go to australia and we would have just barely broken even but one of the guys in the band was like i'd rather make that same amount of money and not have to sit on an airplane for this you know like whatever 16 hours or 20 hours or whatever it is and i was like i was like but it's australia you know yeah, that's the difference exactly and he's never been to australia but he was just like yeah i don't he, he's just not a touring he's that um He's he's not the musician type at all. Like he um, yeah. he's not in it for the adventure of touring or anything. He likes stability and he's kind of OCD about his comfort zones and stuff. Like <laughs> um, yeah. so, yeah. It's just it's not everybody's lifestyle, I guess. The touring touring lifestyle. It is funny how it's like a four way marriage. Like if one person says I don't want to go, then you're not going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Th that's the way Slint worked too. Is always a like we all had to agree on something. If one person didn't, we have to keep compromising until we did. That kind of reminds me of the way things were like in the, in the hardcore scene that I grew up into. Um, just like everybody helped each other out. Like we're all in the same, we're all the, this, all the same misfits in the same, you know, like outsider boat, you know, it was that us against them mentality. Um, but so we all helped each other out. It seemed like bands, like I, my first tour was in a band opening for Sam Hain. Oh no and, um, way! Really? Uh, I mean, there were some shows where we uh, got paid less than the gas to drive. Like we got paid like thirty bucks or something. <laughs> right, sure. And Glenn would like uh, he would help us out. Like he would just pay us out of his pocket. You know, just throw us some some money so we'd have a place to stay that night. You know, and it was he didn't know us really. Uh, but he was super cool. Like I know he has a reputation of being an asshole and all this, but he it was sort of the hard, like the, this sort of the punk band mentality to help each other out, you know? Was that the November Coming Fire tour? It was, yeah. Did you play Birmingham with them on that tour, Birmingham, Alabama? Um, no, we uh, we were with them. 
I think we started with them in Louisville and we ended in Columbus, but we played, we went out to Detroit and, oh man, I can't remember if all the cities. I'll have to look at the old tour dates. Yeah, but it was I, that tour and it was mostly Midwest. I saw that tour. That's why I wondered. I wondered if maybe I'd actually seen you before I knew I'd seen you. What band was that with? It was, it was this pre-slint band called Maurice. Um, yeah. I don't think anyone would have heard of it, but like we, when we broke up, the drummer and I formed Slint. like the last Maurice song became the first Slint song. Um, and, uh, so it, it was kind of like a precursor to that, but it was more, we were more in like this hard metallic hardcore vein. Yeah. Um, but into the dissonance and stuff. But. Yeah. It's so funny that like Slint seems to have sprung fully formed out of a scene where there was nothing like it. Like I've tried to figure out what the antecedents for Slint were, and it's just like I come up completely blank. Man, that's really cool to hear because um, I, I, I mean, I can hear like to me, I can hear all our individual influences and what other bands were doing at the time. That, um, but we only we took we we're pretty specific about the stuff we stole, you know, yeah. from other bands like. Yeah. Sonic Youth sometimes played with clean guitar sounds, and uh, the Meat Puppets played with clean guitar sounds. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, some of the Minutemen stuff. So we kind of, uh, we were really into that, you know? Like, um, And I, I was, like, we were all kind of into Philip Glass, too, and Phil Oaks and <laughs> Leonard Cohen and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, So we had this pretty diverse uh, bag of uh, influences, but it seems like we had to we had to piece it together in a way that um, our friends like our friends like David Grubbs or Albini would we thought that they would like it too. Like we wanted to make it something that our group like pinch from all those influences, but still make it something palatable for us and our friends. You know, um, if that makes any sense. You guys were like pre post hardcore. Like there's because all of those bands you mentioned, Minutemen. And Sonic Youth and and the Meat Puppets all, even though they had clean guitars, there was a certain frantic energy and there was a meditative, like you mentioned Philip Glass, and I hadn't really thought about it, but it makes perfect sense. There's an almost drone-like quality to Spiderland that wasn't present in hardcore. Like yeah. Punk was this weirdly vibrant, completely wide open creative thing for just a few years and then hardcore hit and it was just this big homophobic jock party. And um, totally. Slint just sprang out of that completely different and, and like a whole new thing. I mean, I think part of like, um, uh, the other, or uh, Britt and Brian from Slint are like old, I think they, they're younger than me, but they, um, started off in the punk scene before me. So like they, uh, I feel like our attitude was always to sort of go against the grain of whatever was cool or whatever is happening. Just, and so we were, like at the time bands were still real pretty aggressive. Well, yeah, they were really aggressive and macho, you know, and yeah. we were super nerdy and quiet. Like we, if anything, we tried to play quieter and slower mm -hmm. and we would wear like shorts and, you know, like <laughs> Ralph Lauren pink turtlenecks, you know, <laughs> um, but, but they would be like torn up. Like, so that's yeah. what looked punky. They were torn, but we were, we were suburban kids, you know? So we didn't, try to fake like we weren't um and we uh but it was also part of our like let's just do our own thing and it was it was to us it was sort of more punk to not be aggressive like that and the slower and quieter we got the more it seemed like people kind of hated us um in that world and and at the same time the more defiant that made us to be even more like that, you know? Yeah. Well, there's the good hate when the, all the right people hate you, you know, you're doing something right. Yeah, exactly. When all the cookie cutter, hardcore bands hate you, it's like, yeah, fuck those guys. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're the people that should be, it's like, um, you know, it's like wearing an inverted cross for a metal head. Like it's going to offend Christians. Like it's going to offend the right people almost, you know, yeah. like yeah. people that have, that kind of know, um, that you know understand it's just for shock value or whatever aren't they're not going to be phased by it um so it's sort of like uh yeah if you're pissed if some people are pissed off by what you do you know you're doing something right yeah i mean louisville seemed to have a certain contrary streak right through it um yeah <laughs> in a way because like you know the midwestern hardcore was kind of really catching fire around that time 
Or maybe, maybe I guess that was probably what late eighties, early nineties. So maybe some of that had peaked, but you know, naked Ray gun articles of faith, all those Chicago right. bands. And then there's like crane in Louisville and squirrel bait and slint and all these bands that were doing this whole other weird thing. Yeah. Well, you know, there were punk bands in the, in Louisville in the late seventies, I think in 77, there was bands. Um, and some, some of that, a lot of that stuff was documented, but, um, uh, so there was like a tradition that we were in and part of this is my interpretation of it. You might get a different reading from other guys from that time, but like my, the way I took it was that, um, it was, it, I felt at least at the time that it was really encouraged to have your own sound and it was, you would be laughed out of town if you were ripping off somebody like, obviously, like yeah. if you were a fan of black Sabbath, like, if you if all your songs sounded like Black Sabbath, people would just give you shit in Louisville. But if you had your own sound and kind of took Black Sabbath and did your own thing with it that was un, hadn't been heard, mm-hmm. whether it was good or bad, it was like it was encouraged, you know. Yeah. Like and you have your own sound, like no one else sounds like you. And so that was part of why Slint became what it was, was because yeah. we that was just the mentality, at least amongst our our crew, was like. Uh, you know, you, you do your own thing and um, it wasn't cool to like totally imitate somebody else. Um, yeah. Yeah. One thing I was going to mention about the, you know, about us being like really, or just feeling really in our own worlds and sort of disliked except by the people we cared about, you know, our friends um, uh, was that we, we, in 1989, we did, I wouldn't even call it a tour. It was like some shows out of town, but like we, uh, we played in New York at the Pyramid Club and it was my first time in New York and it was, you know, amazing. And below the Pyramid Club, there was a, a transvestite bar and, you know, I'm a Kentucky guy. I was like, this is so awesome, you know, and the band that, that played before us was called um, Slaughterhouse. And the, they had all these TVs on stage that were had like uh, bestiality and, and shit eating and all this stuff happening on the videos and we had two bass players that were girls playing topless and the singer set his hair on fire and vomited all over the stage so they were like a, a pure like to me they felt like like this is new york this is everything i thought it was going to be <laughs> you know but, this, but then we went on stage like these young kids um and uh like really clean cut and played our weird ass music um I think we played well, though, because we made 50 T-shirts, didn't sell any on the whole tour, but then sold them all that one night in New York. <laughs> and then, That's great. Uh, but, like, I remember going to the bar, and and the, uh, there was a girl next to me at the bar, and, I, and somebody asked her if she had seen Slint and what she thought of them, and uh, she was like, yeah, I saw them. They were, they were too young and too clean. <laughs> and I feel like that's... I feel like that was how people felt about us then. Like we were just these young, clean cut nerds, you know? Yeah. So in 1989, I think we're the same age. I was born in 68. I think you were too, right? Yeah, me too. Yeah. So you would have been what? 19? Uh, I'm trying to think it was because my birthday's on June 25th. So it could, yeah, I was around 18 or 19. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I had my first CB's gig right around then. And it was exactly. Oh, like, wow. It was insane. Wasn't New York just mind blown then? Yeah, it was so different. I, I was in New York yeah. like, like I don't know, maybe six years ago. I was in New York and I got turned around. I said, like, Where the fuck am I? And I was looking around and I was, there was like a bar like full of like craft cocktail people, like where drinks were like 20 bucks. And I was like, I'm not going in there. And, yeah. and I was trying to figure out, like, and I was like, Wait a minute. Is this, if that's, this would be. Avenue, there's no way this is Avenue D. And then I walked down the corner and looked up and I was on Avenue D, which, you know, when we went there the first time, that was Alphabet City. You're going to get cut or shot, you know, yeah, or worse. Yeah. And now there's like two guys standing there with loafers and no socks on talk, talking about brands of golf club. You know, I was like, this is not the same city. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was insane. Like, cause uh, Tompkins Square Park in 89 was 
un- I mean, it was like a shanty town, you know, it was like right. all these cardboard huts throughout. And, um, right. Cause people were moving out of there to go into alphabet city to score dope and then go back to their shanty. Exactly. Yeah. I'm glad I got that one glimpse of old New York because when I came back like a couple of years, um, I guess it hadn't even been that many years later, like Giuliani had already started cleaning the place up and like all that. Uh, I think they had just boarded up, uh, Tompkins square park when I went back, like, like they were in the process of cleaning it all up. Yeah. Um, so it, I mean, I feel like that 89, when I was there in 89, that was the only glimpse I had of like old New York, like pre Giuliani and stuff. One of the guys in five eights family is out on long island so we would play there like twice a year from the time i joined the band in 1990 or so right up until 97 or 8 so well so you really got to see the the city change yeah i wasn't really like i'm from i'm from north carolina like middle of nowhere north carolina and so new york was just constantly unfolding in front of me and changing and blowing my mind every time i was there it was pretty great yeah are you from louisville originally um, well, uh, yeah, it's, I was, it's weird. I was thinking about that today. Like I, I feel like I'm like a Louisvillean, but I was born in Texas, but we moved when I was three. Yeah. And then we lived in like rural Illinois, um, for a couple of years. So I didn't like, I didn't move. I, I moved to Louisville, like when I started third grade. So I can't remember how old you are in third grade. Like, what is it? Eight, eight or something? Yeah. So so yeah, I feel like I'm a Louisvillean, but <laughs> yeah. I wasn't actually born there. Um, yeah, but all those formative experiences of middle school and high school and all that, like that's where, yeah. where that happens really forms you kind of. I guess I, like, uh, my brother was my older brother, you know, um, uh, like stranger things. One of the things I liked about it was the, the cause was the older brother turning his younger brother onto like the clash and stuff. Cause yeah. that's exactly what my older brother did. Like yeah. he turned me on to the clash and, um, dead Kennedys and pistols and all that stuff. But cause I was like a little metalhead, like a little <laughs> like Van Halen fan and stuff. Are and you like a uh, shredder guitar player. Totally. Yeah. Like I still, well, I mean, I'd, I'd have to sit down with them, but like I, I used to know like the first five Van Halen records, note for note, like, um, and I still like to like figure out Ingve Malmsteen solos and stuff, just to keep my keep practicing, you know, to keep uh, yeah, yeah, just to know that I have some of the technique still, um, even though there's almost no opportunity or, or reason, or I I don't have I have very little desire to ever use it other than just sh- you know showing off at home <laughs> by myself. But you know, I feel like when you have that kind of facility, it informs your playing, like. For example, like I've so because I've been sort of locked in here and haven't been able to play drums and and like loud noises kind of upset my kid. Um, I've been playing guitar instead of playing drums every night, and I thought I'd learn some stuff, you know. And it's amazing which guitar players I've sat down to learn and been like, well, this should be pretty easy, and then been like, holy shit, like. Like, <laughs> like East Bay Ray from the Dead Kennedys, that guy is a fucking beast, man. He's really good. Yeah, that's a hard one to start with, I would think. Yeah, like, trying to learn Holiday in Cambodia. This song's got like 27 chords in it. Yeah, and he flies through them and plays them really precisely. You know, like he yeah. not off the beat ever. And, you know, yeah. takes a lot of accuracy to play like that. That guy's an underrated genius. And, you know, completely changing, like, speeds. Dave, Dave Navarro... Uh, like, yeah. like I was going to learn a couple of Jane's Addiction songs just because that's sort of a guilty pleasure of mine. And like his guitar parts are really interesting. Like they're unexpectedly, like they're simple where they need to be simple. And then there's like elements of like, oh, this guy was a shredder at some point. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can kind of tell. Totally. Yeah. And, and he probably grew up on all, like on playing Jimmy Page and all the, um, all the guitar hero stuff, you know? Yeah. When did you start playing guitar? Um, I, I started playing drums first. I was like 12 or 13. And, uh, and then I, uh, I got a guitar um, just to like a cheap, like Les Paul copy for, I think it was $90. And, uh, and I just played the hell out of it. And it seemed like once, once I got, um, once I learned how to play the open chords, you know, the basic chords everybody learns, like, yeah. It seemed like after 
everything was easy. Like I just had to get over that one hump and then, uh, and I started figuring out the Van Halen stuff. And I think, um, a year later I was already, I started playing in a, in a band and we were doing like Zeppelin and Rush covers and stuff. Yeah. And then, and then I started playing in, um, like in, in punk bands. Well, like what I was going to say was like, uh, my older brother died by suicide when I was 16. So he was 18. Um, and, and I think that's when I really just like threw myself into music. Like that was, uh, sort of, it was, I, I guess I just felt like, oh, well, I'm going to, I actually had this weird belief that I wouldn't make it to 19, just like my brother didn't. Um, so I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to play punk music and, go crazy for a while so um and that's when i really started playing with a bu- bunch of different bands and then um yeah and then uh slint started and uh you know started touring more and stuff so that was a that was a the big transition for me and i and it wasn't until you know years later that i realized that it, it was the death of my brother that kind of pushed me um to to just do nothing but music. Is depression like a thing that runs in your family? You think? I think it. I think it does. Yeah, because my mom has it. She's she's been on antidepressants for as long as long as I can remember, really. Um, yeah. uh, and and I definitely have problems with it. But my the only one who seems like uh, has a good head on his shoulders <laughs> is my younger brother. Like somehow. He seemed to have deflected everything. I was like, "How did you shake the Paho curse?" And he's like, "I don't know." Like, but he's he's well aware of what I mean, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first sort of become aware of your depression? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just thought it was, it was just uh, a way of life, you know. Like, um, and I, I guess I had the romantic idea that as an artist, you suffer and you're depressed and you're you're eventing Van Gogh about it, you know, like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, so I, I had that kind of romanticism. Uh, I always had some sort of death obsession, like, and this is a weird thing. Um, but like the night that my brother died, you know, which was really surreal, like a s- sudden death at a young age like that is just surreal enough as it is, but, um, to find out that it was suicide. And then, um, and my mom was, crying and i remember she said to me like uh we always thought that it would be you that would do something like this <laughs> you know and uh, which is a harsh like i know what she meant um and i i know she didn't mean it in a bad way but i was like the problem child i was the one drawing skulls all the time you know sure. he was like the straight laced kid yeah um so it, i seemed like the more likely candidate for something like that um but it did uh but i i you know i definitely had depression and stuff before that i and i never thought of it as depression i just thought i felt things really really strong and i thought everybody did they just didn't share it you know yeah that's exactly what my childhood sort of conceptualization of my depression was exactly that like i felt yeah. like i just took things too hard yeah but it's funny the thing you were talking about where you were the one drawing skulls and kind of acting out a little bit like i think the kids like us survive a lot of the time whereas someone who's like wearing the masks as tightly as your brother was like there's no there's no relief from it yeah yeah i know that's um i feel like uh you know there's a um before like you know we we grew up when things like music therapy and art therapy weren't really like known concepts or at least uh, at least where I grew up and, but I always thought, I, I always thought of music as therapeutic and stuff. And when I started playing in aggressive bands and stuff, like I felt like, uh, I knew I just, I didn't even question it that much. I just knew I, I just had to get all this stuff out and I was just driven to do it, you know? Um, but like when I look back on it later, it was really constructive. Like, even though the music seemed maybe really negative and scary, like if a parent might be like, uh, I'm really concerned about my son uh, and the, the the stuff he's writing and all this. But like, uh, it really was like, um, uh, you know, confused kids getting out their confusion um, in a way that wasn't harming anybody. Uh, 
So, yeah, I don't know. Like I event like when I went to college, I um I I st- actually studied art therapy because I always felt like, you know, like the art I did and the music I did was it was all therapy, you know. Yeah. How long was Slint together the first time? Uh we we formed in 86 and then broke up. I feel like it was like mid 1990 somewhere around there like maybe maybe fall of 1990 and then you went um, out to college uh well I, I was i was i had started college when i was still in still in flint yeah. but i you know i would come back for breaks and for the summer and stuff or yeah could do things yeah was there any awareness in Slint of like how long a, a shadow that band was casting over like indie music? Oh no, no, uh, we, no! It seemed like the only people that liked us were our friends, like people we knew, and there was a small scene in Chicago, like uh, that Albini was kind of at the forefront of uh, that that liked us, and you know, like the Jesus Lizard guys, they they just started. Like their show was opening for Slint, um, and so and they liked us and you know we were all there was like a small crew of people that liked slant but other than that like when we broke up i you know our rec spiderline hadn't even come out yet and we had a whole european tour that we were supposed to do and um you know i, I just i just figured you know we were gonna <laughs> if anybody was gonna listen to us in the future i thought it was gonna be some a guy that only lists seventy eights on a Victorola, <laughs> you know, like, right, right. The, the file that, right. that uh, like I found this obscure band. Like they only put out this one record, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I, none of us had any idea that anybody else would like us, um, or that would even hear us. And I think I think some of us still kind of struggle with the fact that Slint still <laughs> is. Um, I don't know, like is still, what's the word? Like still relevant today. Yeah. And on some level, like, um, like, like, uh, I feel like some band members still are just like, we're, we're just a, um, you know, nostalgia trip for some people, you know, but there is like a younger generation that's, that's into it. Like, yeah. They get it. I mean, I, I'm a studio engineer when I'm not, on the road or being a dad or doing a podcast. And I have like 27 year old dudes who are like, have you heard this band? I'm like, yes, I really, I've, I've heard yeah. Slint. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. Cause I feel like we were, you know, we were young when we wrote and recorded that stuff. So I feel like, uh, like that same age group still taps in on it. Like it's, it has, I, I'm just grateful that, like, whatever magic happened on that record, I'm grateful that it did happen. I don't know what we did right, and I don't, I don't think I'll ever know. But yeah, well, it's just a great sounding record. It's like, you, the, yeah. What's great about the cover is that you guys are all, you know, neck deep in water, and that's exactly how that record feels. Like you just sort of plunge yeah. into it, you know, and and it's it's atmospheric and it's moody and it's kind of cold and it's it's perfect. That is true. Yeah. I mean, the um, the the reason the record even looked like I think it would have been a different record if we'd had more money. Like we recorded it in two weekends, like from Friday night to Monday morning, um, uh, and so it, it was. But we rehearsed it for like a year or longer, like practicing five or six nights a week, or if not every night. Um, so it was like, like, and then to to write and practice like six songs for that long. And then, and then just bust it out in a recording studio. Like I never thought about it. We were just excited to get a record uh-huh. at the songs record. Um, and, but like the, we'd spent all our budget on the recording. And so we had to have a black and white record. And I think we, that's why it ended up being so dark and we wanted it to be more colorful. <laughs> <laughs> But all we we talked uh, touch and go into letting us use one color, and so we just had the song titles in green on the back. Yeah. So it ended it ended up becoming this really minimal thing, and then we were broken up before it came out. So there was a lot of mystery. Like there was there was no tour. It got passed around, and I think it created a mystique that necessarily, you know, I was 
wasn't necessarily true. Like we're, uh, I th- I mean, we all, we are weird people. Like I would say all of us have our own mental disabilities in the band yeah. <laughs> in our own. Yeah. But, um, so I, I think some of the mystery is justified, but I mean, m- mostly we, we just like, like to uh, like any other band we just like to laugh and make i think we're painted as being this really dark these really dark teenagers moody teenagers and and we probably were privately but um as you know when we were together it was all all laughs and still like that you know yeah so you left slint and you went to college did you finish college no i did uh i did everything but my my general ed classes (laughs) and then at that point i was like i'm making more like money from royalties and music like that's all i want to do so i just abandoned and plus they they uh the art therapy program shut down at my college and i was i liked my teacher and that program and that was the whole reason i was there so when that when that ended i just didn't even want to go to school anymore what college was that it was university of evansville in indiana yeah which which is but, like the only thing good about it was their art therapy program to me. Well, then there was like this whirlwind of like of of people that you played with. Of course, Will Oldham is from Louisville, and that's a very natural connection, as well as King Kong and, and yeah. But like, and then out from there, like I guess maybe that was because Slint was just so fucking incredibly influential that you know people like Billy Corgan are calling. Yeah. I mean, all those, um, all the bands that I played with, it just, um, it was never, it it all just sort of happened that way. Like when I ended up in Tortoise, uh, I think I was, yeah, like my two favorite bands in the early nineties were, were the, I loved the first Tortoise album and, uh, I loved Stereo Lab and I had no, I had, I had a connection to Tortoise because I knew, um, Bundy and McIntyre, but I didn't have any connection to Stereo Lab, and then uh, it just worked out that um, I, you know, Tortoise needed a member for a tour, and I, I thought I was joining temporarily, and this is how it usually happens. I just help them out, like help bands out, and then I end up being in the band. Yeah, <laughs> um, and like, and it it was good. Like I got to move to Chicago, and then uh, I found out that uh, Stereo Lab were big. King Kong fans and Tortoise bands, so, and so I ended up playing with Stereo Lab for a while, and then so it was like my two favorite bands, current bands in the early '90s. I was lucky enough to j- play with. Like um, it was, it's crazy how that works, and the whole Corgan thing was just weird. Yeah, that all seems it seems weird. It, it was. It's kind of a funny story how I ended up in the band now. Like I. Um, should I tell you? Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, if you're comfortable with the whole world hearing, or at least a couple thousand people. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't mind. That's <laughs> yeah. funny. Cause, so uh, my friend Matt Sweeney has known Billy for a while, and uh, he and I'd seen the Pumpkins like five or six times because I was playing in King Kong. We were the first band on the side stage at Lollapalooza, and Pumpkins were the last band on the main stage. Or mm-hmm. maybe it was them or the Beastie Boys. I can't remember. Yeah. And... And I, and I never, like, like on to be honest, like I never got into the pumpkins, and I, um, and I would watch from like backstage. I would, they were at their peak. Billy still had hair and stuff, and I, and I would watch them every night, trying to figure out why people liked them, and I still, like, I still couldn't remember any of their songs. And <laughs> and Billy never ceased to give me shit about that. Like he's, he was like, you haven't heard 1979. I was. No, or, or like he would name a song. Or like I was like, I know the Rat in the Cage lyric. Mm-hmm. Um, like that was all right. I knew. Right. And all I still kind of knew, really. Um, but anyway, like he, uh, sweet. I was in L.A. mastering a record, a solo record, um, and Sweeney was in L.A. But he was with Billy, and they were auditioning for bass players. And he was like, I, I was just joking. When I was talking to him. Like I wanted to hook up, like just meet up with them because we're in the same city and. Uh, he, I was like, oh, well, let, I was like, let me in on that shit. Like when he said he was in the band with Billy, I thought it'd be, I was kind of, I was like joking, but, it, um, he was like, yeah, come on over. And I, I was like, I was like, do you guys have a swimming pool? He was at the Chateau Marmont, <laughs> which I, never, 
<laughs> I'd never even heard of, you know, but I, I thought it was just a hotel. And I was like, he was like, yeah. I was like, okay, I'll come over and swim. And he's like, yeah, you can use our pool. And he invited me to his room. And I, so I showed up with my swimsuit and a towel and, and I knock on his door and, and Corgan answers the door. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, I come in and, um, they're, they're talking like, like, Oh, we just got off this audition. We've been through 26 people, like nobody's working and all this stuff. And I saw a guitar there. And I, I remember like when I saw the pumpkins, I remember there being a lot of guitar solos and, um, I was like, I'm going to show off. And like, I know Billy thinks he's a great guitarist, but I'm going to show him some shit. And I started doing all my, my guitar center, like in Bay Malmsteen, like <laughs> super fast opener picking. <laughs> and I, and I just like, um, to me it was like that's what i did in the 80s like you would go to the guitar store and pick up the guitar and you just show off your licks and right. hope that like a little crowd of people would sit around and watch you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's usually what happened yeah it was like um so i just did that and i remember seeing uh billy and jimmy looking at each other like uh like holy shit you know and um mm -hmm. and then i put the guitar back and then i uh he told me about like what he was looking like, what kind of band he wanted to make. He wanted it to be more positive and all this stuff. I was like, Oh yeah, that's really cool. And then, um, when I left there, I realized I hadn't swam at all. Like I was like, fuck man, I didn't get to go swimming. And, and Matt called, <laughs> Matt called me and he was, he was like, you got the gig. Like you're playing bass. They like you. And I was oh, like, so I didn't audition or anything. It yeah. was just cause I did the show off thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just bummed that I didn't get to go swimming. Like, um, but it it was you know at the, but I have I was curious about that the mainstream music world because I had no experience with it like yeah. I felt like I knew the other side of it the indie side really well mm -hmm. and I was really curious about the other like I just wanted to see what it was like you know yeah so. you know I did this interview a couple of months ago um, with the guy from Presidents of the United States of America and uh -huh. like it was probably the most mainstream guy I've interviewed for the podcast, but he, he also, uh, does, uh, he's got this alter ego. That's just does kids music. And it's like the least obnoxious kids music that my kid got into. And I got to really like it. And then like by some, it wasn't like a big thing that he's publicly like, yeah, I'm this other guy that is called Casper baby pants. And somehow I'd like managed to sort of plug in the fact that the Chris Ballou from President of the United States of America is Casper Baby Pants, and then I had to talk to him. Oh no way! Yeah, so he was talking. It's real. His his children's music is great. I I wanted to talk to him about why he just sort of in the middle of probably at the peak of the President of the United States of America's power, like he just pulled a plug and went home and became a kid star. And he said because in that mainstream music world where you're experiencing pop success, and it's just like the demands on your life and time are ever increasing and you just keep moving into a series of slightly larger rooms and it sucks just as bad as the last one, but they're like, the next room is going to be great. So, you know, <laughs> you, you go from yeah. a van to a bus to two buses and, but it's just never like, it's always like, this sucks. I'm only getting four hours of sleep a night and I'm exhausted and everyone's making money, but me and it's like, well, wait, the next room is awesome and it never changes yeah. <laughs> and that's sort of my now sort of outside perception of kind of that mainstream music success world yeah that makes sense i mean it's like this unattainable things will get better kind of scenario um i and yeah i don't like the i i know i can it's like the it's like the money stuff i feel like i can it's i'm really I don't care about money, but like I, I do, if, if music generates money, I want it to go to the right people. You know, that's all I care about. Yeah. And I don't go into the wrong people that, that don't give a shit about music or did no work for it or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I totally, that's the only, that's the only thing I care about. And when it, when things start to get on a, on a bigger scale, it's harder to keep track of that stuff. Like, um, for me personally, like I know Fugazi can do it. I don't know how, um, there's a lot of things they can do that I don't know how they can do that. <laughs> like, I, mean, um, I think there's just a hyper vigilance there, like a level of like, like I, I, I would like to think that I care about things as much as Ian McKay or Guy Picciotto, but I don't, I just don't, yeah. I don't care that much. Like I, I want to care yeah. that much, but I just like, like I'm not going to be like, 
climbing all over the kids at the show at the VFW hall to make sure they didn't stick any gum on the wall or anything. I don't care enough. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like I heard that speech at the VFW, like you would leave this place cleaner than it was when you got here because you know, like I was like, oh, okay, okay, Fugazi, you know. Did they actually say that? I'm sorry. It was wow. something like that. Like there was, we did a. I went to see them somewhere, and it, it was like a, you know, it was a venue that wasn't regularly a venue. It was really before kind of the peak of like their success when they were still coming up. So, I, so the first, this is a funny story. I played with Vic Chestnut for a while. Oh, um, nice. And this, like, pre-Vic, but before Little came out, before people sort of knew of Vic as a singer-songwriter, he was the bass player in this band called Angle Lake that I was in. And when I joined Angle Lake, there was just two guitar players and me, and, they, and I replaced another drummer. And then Vic joined the band. And the band changed completely, and we sort of kind of went to Vic instead of Vic coming to us. And at the time, I was like a 20-year-old knucklehead, and I resented the shit out of it. But um, we ended up opening for Fugazi, uh, and we had gone from being this like really sort of crazy horse-influenced, huge, loud band to doing like Vic Dynamics, which is very similar to what right. was on that last tour with all the guys from Canada. The, um, you know, Guy was sort of acting as music director and there were all these musicians from all these different kind of really gritty genres and they were doing this like thing where they were playing so quietly you could nearly hear Vic's heart beating and then like the roof would fall in like a Russian parking garage and it would be thunderously loud and then it would go back down to nothing again. And that was kind of yeah. like Angle Lake at the time. When I when I played with Vic and I I and Guy when he was at Vic's funeral and he mentioned that show and I was like oh shit I I fucking played drums at that show um so yeah it was a uh, um it was a learning experience playing with Vic he was a really yeah um he was I mean he was a difficult dude you know um, yeah but incredibly talented and productive but um. Yeah, so I, I was a huge Fugazi fan, and the, like the, 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 but the first time I saw them was opening for them, because uh, I had been a Minor Threat fan and was super stoked. And then I saw them a few more times, and one time was in a little, like, VFW hall, like, you know, punk promoter thing. Right. So there's this number of years where you were like gun for hire and played in like all these incredible bands, like. It 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 will hold them. The Four Carnation, Tortoise, Stereo Lab, Royal Trucks, King Kong, Bush League. I'm, I got a list here. I made some notes, and of course Vaughn and the AA Yes and Interpol. Um, but you you just mentioned that how much you loved Tortoise and Stereo Lab before you joined those bands. Were you nervous playing with those guys? Um, I I I weirdly wasn't. Like I I think like because I just like every band I play with, I always think of it as like, um, like an education, you know, like I, like I, I'm learning somebody else's songs and this is really exciting. Uh, like I, like I, like would I have thought of this baseline, you know, um, or that. And so I, I really, I, I really approach, I, I'm kind of I, I like for considering how shy and awkward I was then, especially like, I feel like I was pretty bold or maybe really competent musically where I was just like, this is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, uh, but like once I was on stage, I was, it was a whole different thing. Like I, I always played with my back to the audience and stuff. Like I, yeah. I was really shocked and had stage fright, but like, um, I, I guess I, uh, but like getting, getting into and practicing with them, I wasn't, I don't feel like I was nervous. Like I was, uh, they just, they felt like equals, you know? Um, yeah yeah i really that's i really envy that i'm always i'm always anxious when i come to a new when i'm playing with strangers there's a part of me that's always yeah really feel exposed and um how are you managing your depression through all of that because that's a lot of oh you mean back then how yeah, was i doing it yeah um i really wasn't you know I, I feel like i just i was just going from you know like uh, from I was just going with the flow and going from adventure to adventure, and then uh, and then it seemed like every couple of years I would have some sort of meltdown where, <clears throat> uh, yeah, where depression would hit me really hard, and it was almost always relationship based, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't, in, and I, you know, I, 
I've had therapists my entire life, like, um, like off and on. So it, that never seemed to do much for me. I liked, I'm more, I liked reading about therapies more than I liked having a therapist, like, <laughs> <laughs> which is weird, I guess. But I liked, I, I felt like I learned more by, by reading like Carl Jung or something, you know, or about yeah. cognitive behavioral therapy than, than I did like, like talking to therapists. Because I guess I always had a girlfriend that I would talk to like my therapist, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it seemed like I'd always have a meltdown. I just, I also thought that was normal too. Like I thought everybody had a, went into a dark depression every couple of years, like, um, and I guess, I guess I actually still don't know what's normal as far as depression goes, but, um, I, they, it seemed like they became more frequent and it became, uh, more, more severe, like, um, and I never thought they could get more severe. Like <laughs> it always felt like I was at rock bottom, but somehow they would go on for longer and they'd get darker and darker. Um, <laughs> You're like, who knew this dungeon had a basement? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, there's 17 sub levels in hell. Yeah. Like I didn't. Like, wait, there's 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I know what you're talking about. So at some point, you left Chicago. You ended up in Hoboken, right? Uh, um, I end. Well, I yeah. I guess I've moved around a lot. Yeah. I always had a place in Louisville. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I left Chicago, went back to Louisville lived in New York for a while. Yeah, I guess I, it wasn't until I got, um, I got married and we lived and we moved to, from New York to Ohio because we decided to have kids and she got like a good job there. Mm -hmm. And then we, and then we moved to New Jersey after that, yeah. um, to like, but near Philly, like the, uh, South Jersey. Yeah. That's where Lance is from, by the way. Lance That's Banks. right. He was, uh, Cherry Hill. Yeah. yeah, I was from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. That's where I met him. Yeah. No, no, wait. I met him in Athens, but then I met his entire like friend group, all of his high school buddies. If he set up a show for the, he was Lance toured with uh, my band Five Eight. Like, just he documented like every move for a year or two, and was this incredible oh, cool. traveling companion. And 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 we went everywhere. Like Five Eight was doing two hundred shows a year, and about two thirds of those Lance was in the van and. He set up a show for us in Cherry Hill, and I got to meet all his buddies. It was great. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we lived in Cherry for a bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and then made like a couple towns over. But So it seems like you were able to cobble together a living, you know, uh, in all these indie bands. Um, yeah. And, and kind of hold it together. But it's funny how kids kind of really throw that lifestyle into sort of stark relief. Yeah, it wasn't until I had my my till my daughter was born when uh when i started playing with the yeah yeah yeahs and then i had a second kid and i um started playing with interpol like and there they are bands that i love but they also um they pay a salary and stuff like it felt like i i had a normal job yeah um which was nice you know because i love you know it's like getting just getting paid to do what you love is always great and yeah. somehow i managed to make a living like i haven't had a I haven't had a day job since 93, I think. Um, like it's, it's all been my, my, all my income has been from music. That's amazing and fantastic and well-deserved. I don't, don't want to make it sound like I'm minimizing that at all. Is it just, that's so fucking great. I mean, I was, I, there's, <laughs> I figured out the rhythm, you know, like there's going to be droughts that might last, you know, years and there's might be, and then you'll make a lot of money for a couple of years. And I just kind of figured out how to save that money. And you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. uh, it's not like I ever got rich or anything. It was just like, I, um, somehow I figured out how to survive off, off this weird career. Well, you've um, had the same coffee maker for 13 years. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. not a small thing. Like people don't understand. Like I have these friends who want to be professional musicians, but they also want to drive like recent vehicles. And I'm like, buddy, you got to pick one. You can't have a 2019 yeah. <laughs> uh, Honda and play guitar in pans. Like it's just not how it works. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, you have to have your priorities, and some some of the stuff. Yeah, 
some of that stuff is just fleeting, you know, like, um, but the music you kind of have to live with afterwards. <laughs> Hey, Crash and Ride would like to let you know about a new industry-wide initiative focused on mental health called Backline. Backline is a hub for artists, industry professionals, and their families to quickly and easily access mental health and wellness resources. Backline is partnered with leading support organizations and care providers to streamline access to services specifically geared towards the music industry. Go to www.backline.care to get the support that you need to thrive both on and off the road. The way that Backline works is you contact them via their website or their 800 number and they will connect you with a caseworker. That caseworker will be familiar with resources in your area to get you the mental health care that you need. If you need to talk to a therapist, they can put you in touch with a therapist. If you need to talk to a psychiatrist and be evaluated for meds, they have a list of psychiatrists. They have resources for inpatient therapy. They can put you in touch with sober companions. If you need someone to travel with you while you're on the road and help you stay out of trouble, Backline is a really end-to-end comprehensive solution for people who are struggling in the music industry. Now, a little closer to home, if you're in the Athens, Georgia area and you're a musician struggling with anxiety and depression, you can contact NucciSpace at 706-227-1515 or go to nuci.org. That's nucci.org. NucciSpace is a nonprofit musician's resource focused on suicide prevention. Here's how Nucci's works. If you contact them and you say, hey, look, I'm in crisis, whether you're a musician or not, they'll connect you with resources in the Athens, Georgia area. If you're a musician, that health care will be subsidized. In my own case, I was able to see a counselor for 15 or 20 bucks a session. If you're not a musician, they'll do their best to connect you with low cost or sliding scale options for mental health care in Athens. Nuju Space provides a lot of resources for musicians in the Athens area. They have low cost practice spaces, they have a gear cell where they're constantly selling second hand gear, they've got a low cost recording studio. They're really just an amazing asset to the Athens, Georgia music scene, but their primary mission is helping people who are depressed or anxious get better. Go to nuci.org, that's nuci.org, or call 706-227-1515. And finally, no matter where you are, if you're struggling with anxiety and depression and you're contemplating self-harm, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. It's 24-7. It's free. It's confidential. They have trained volunteers to help get you through your crisis and get you the help that you need. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. We go to Suicide Prevention Lifeline.org. So it's it seems like, and uh, you know you don't have to go any deeper into this than you're comfortable with, but. Uh, 2015 was a real low point. Yeah, that really was. Like, I, I've i never been that low before. Like, because, um, like, s- suicide was kind of, was always kind of fascinating to me, but it was never, but because of my, because I had sp- ex- a direct experience with it and I saw how it affected the survivors, um, I, I, I just ruled it out as an option. Like, things will get really dark, but I just can't you know, I'll never do that because I know, I know that what that is like already, you know, like, um, and, uh, so I just ruled it out. And then I think by the time that happened, like I had been so depressed for, for so long, like for like six months straight, I had been only thinking about suicide, um, you know, like, and, um, you know, my only, my only sort of source of joy outside of my kids was, um, was like writing suicide notes. Like it made me feel better. It was so weird. Uh, and, and so when things kind of came to a head, I, uh, yeah, I finally did, or I, not finally, but I, I ended up doing it and, um, kind of miraculously surviving, uh, I mean, I don't mind talking about it because, I mean, I just hope it's not triggering for other people. That's that's my only issue. Well, um, we talk about it a lot on this podcast. Um, I've had 
I've had a bunch of guests who at one time or another attempted suicide. And um, the one sort of unifying thought that seems to have been with everybody who thought about ending their own life was not that they wanted to die, but that they wanted the pain to stop. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that suicide was a, re- the thought of suicide, uh, contemplating not living with that pain anymore was a relief. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. You know, it's, um, it's, it seems like that's the only way you can stop the pain. And you also, there's a feeling of aloneness, you know, that nobody's ever going to get it. Or, or understand your position. And, and for me, like, uh, like I, I learned after my attempts just because of what people said that there are a, a lot of myths and taboo about suicide. Like it's just, it's a taboo just to talk about it. You know, like if you bring it up over dinner, it's gonna, like everyone gets morbid and like all of a sudden like, Oh, the, the, the conversation's taking a dark turn now <laughs> where it's just, you, you know, like if you talk about your uncle having cancer, it's not like that, you know, yeah. it's, um, to me, it should not be like that. So like after my attempt, I, I felt like it was my duty to talk about it and make it, make it a normal thing to talk about depression and suicide and not this, uh, you know, it has to be this icky thing that like bums out <laughs> bums everybody out you know yeah. um we should just be it should we should talk uh openly and plainly about it um yeah. but there was the the myths also were that um like one of them that i was confronted with is that it's a selfish act like people would be like well what about your kids and all this stuff like how could you do that like you're you know um but when when you're in that position and that when you're feeling that much despair like you you think you're doing the world a favor by, by getting out of the world, you know, cause you think that I was convinced that I, the only thing I brought to the world was a, uh, I was a bad influence on my kids. I was a bad influence on everybody. Like I broke every <laughs> partner's heart, you know, yeah. uh, all it was spread misery in this world. And that by leaving it, I would be doing the world a favor, you know? And that's, yeah. that's a myth that, um, that's not true. You know, that's a, that's just a seductive lie that people, that depressed people become, it's, it's a hard argument to not, you know, it's, it's really, it's a seductive argument, you know, and, and we fall for it. And, um, and, it, and it's not true, but, uh, it's not a selfish act. Like when the people that do it don't feel like they're being selfish. They actually feel like they're doing humanity a favor, you know? So it's, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about suicide that I think is um, is just wrong, you know? Yeah. There's this one girl I talked to afterwards. I mean, <clears throat> she she was like, she was like, oh, come on. You're like, you, you wanted to be rescued. Like, you wanted to be saved. And I, she was like, why, why did you post your suicide note online? And I was like, well, because I knew that when my brother died, there was a lot of rumors floating around. And I didn't want there to be any rumors. Like, I wanted there my intentions to be like, just so well known, like, uh, no question about it, where my head was at, you know, that's why I did it. And she was like, but you, you know, you have to admit you wanted to be rescued. I was, I didn't know, I didn't say anything to her, but I was like, nobody jumps off a tree with a a one inch thick manila rope noose around their neck, wanting to be rescued. Like who, nobody does that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I yeah. saw the pictures, so I was on the internet that night, cause I, like most nights, because I'm a nerd, and um, <laughs> like the bat signal went up, like, does anybody know how to get, does anybody know how to find Dave Pajo? And I was like, what the fuck is this all about? And I dug into it, and then, like, you know, there was a swirl of panic, um, especially, I know a ton of people in Chicago were all part of that sort of electrical audio, internet, PRF scene, and and, and, yeah. and there was a lot of discussion there. And then somebody posted, they got a piece. Okay. Yeah. That's wow. You were, you were present during all that. I was there in real time. Like I was like frantically refreshing, like trying, cause I, you know, I'm not, I didn't live in Chicago at the time I was living in Athens, Georgia. And, 
and uh, I didn't know anybody close to you, but you know your your work had been important to me, and I saw the note, and I was like, I've been there. I know this feeling, and I also know that it goes away if you can fucking outlast it. And like, there was no way that yeah. that I could reach you or anybody who's ever been there in that moment to tell them that. But I was like, "Fuck, man!" When I saw that, like, pictures the next day of you in the hospital with the, like the ligature marks on your neck, I was like, "Jesus fucking Christ!" It was so close. Yeah, it really was, man. I mean, um, yeah, I like it's it's really it's really good that like somebody's you know a, a, a cop saw it and like cut me down or whatever but like were you conscious at that point do you remember anything about that moment man i remember everything like uh it's i mean i had what what would be a near death experience like i mean i, I um yeah I, I was fully conscious which is so bizarre uh i think the one like I don't know how much I should get into it, but like, um, yeah, I, I was aware, like, and I was aware when they cut me down, but my, it was, um, I'll, I'll say like when I was in that state, uh, I was in a, a state of consciousness that wasn't, it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, like people talk about the light at the end of the tunnel and they see yeah. Jesus there with a rose <laughs> i don't know but like yeah. they or they see buddha whatever their religion is they see that person you know mm -hmm. um like i i did see like a a light like that but it was like freeze frame like if you pause the dvd mm -hmm. and um uh and and i had this awareness of self like there was me looking at there was a sense of me looking at it but there were no thoughts and there were no um there was no sense of anything connected to this world. Like I wasn't a parent. I wasn't a father, you know, I wasn't, um, a son. I wasn't like, there was none of that. There was just a, a me, you know, there was, there was just a sense of self looking at something and that was it. So it's a, it was a weird state of consciousness for sure. Yeah. And then when I came back into the world, um, I remember, uh, yeah, my first thought was like, fuck, you know, now things are going to be worse, you know, because yeah. I like, I, I couldn't even do this right. You know, that kind of feeling. Um, so, so my own experience with the, the moments leading up to, to deciding to, to take my own life were just feeling like everything I touched turned to shit for exactly. Yeah. Ever. And when people talk about the selfishness of it, and I think, I don't think you understand how many lives I ruined heading into my decision to stop ruining other people's lives. And yeah, and so, even Vic Chestnut, he had an unsuccessful suicide attempt. Um, I don't remember exactly how long before he actually did manage to kill himself. And he sat right. up in bed, or lifted his head up in bed, uh, re regaining consciousness for the first time since the attempt, and looked around and said, Motherfucker! Just absolutely yeah. frustrated that he... yeah. It was, it was fucking terrible. That, that was exactly my feeling. Like, um, yeah, it's so weird. Like, cause I, uh, you know, I didn't, I played possum. Like I just didn't want to talk to any of the paramedics or anything. So I just, I just kept my eyes closed and, um, pretended I was unconscious. <laughs> but, um, but when I was in the emergency room and they, you know, they flashed the light into your eyes and stuff, the, uh, you know, I had to talk and stuff and, and she, uh, she, she asked me how I felt. That was the first thing she asked me. And I was like, uh, I wish I was dead, you know, like I wish I had died. And, uh, she was sort of taken aback cause I don't think she was expecting that. And then she was like, well, I'm glad you're here. And she gave me like a pat and I don't know what, like, it seems so insignificant, but I just, you know, I just started, I was like quietly crying, you know, cause I couldn't, it was like the first time somebody had said that they were glad that I was there. Like I, that I felt some sort of, and she didn't even know me, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know why it just really, really struck me because that, but that was my first feeling like, uh, and it lingered for at least a couple hours afterwards, like where 
I had just completely fucked up. Like I couldn't, you know, like if I wished I'd been successful, but it sort of went away and it got replaced with, um, this, like this idea that I had a second chance, you know, and, yeah. and this gratitude, um, pretty fast and it's hasn't gone away. So your kids were what? Eight. And uh, five at that time. That's right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I'd written letters to them. Like I had a, I had a backpack full of stuff, packages, and or like gifts and letters for people and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so you know what it's like. But uh, I feel like there's a lot of um, a lot of lies when you're depressed that you tell yourself, and and they become truth, you know. And now I see them as red flags but then i didn't see it like one of one of them is that you're the world would be a better place without you like that's just not true but um but you're convinced that it's true and another one is that you're alone and that's not true either like you're actually never alone it's almost annoying like that we're not alone (laughs) you know (laughs) it's you know what i mean yeah no um yeah i know that's the thing is like it's it's real like it's just really poor self, like really bad self image and self worth. Cause I mean, I, I was convinced that every girl I ever dated only, <laughs> only liked me or loved me out of sympathy because they felt so sorry for me. And, <laughs> um, and I laugh now, but like it took, it was, it took like a long time and di- you know, like it took some people just telling me like, it's kind of insulting that you don't believe that I love you because of who you are, you know, but that you think it's out of sympathy because you're such a piece of shit, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it really is like self image. If you're convinced that you're worthless, you know, you're gonna, um, you can't understand how anybody could love you, you know? But, you know, eventually, um, if you're lucky, you sort of claw your way back into being a person. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Like, um, I, I think what happened, well, part of what happened to me was like, I was very much like still in love with my, uh, my wife at the time who was, you know, I was going through a divorce and I found out she'd been cheating on me and all this stuff. And, um, and like the way that the, the, the way she treated me after the suicide, I was like, oh, wow, she really does not love me at all, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, you know, like, I, and I needed to know that, you know, because yeah. a part of me in my head, I was like, well, she'll just come around, you know, she'll she'll fall back in love with me again. Um, but then the way she, I, I kind of realized that she did not love me afterwards. And I was like, well, well that's what I needed to know, really, because then I could move on. I was like, oh, I can deal with that, Yeah, you know? It's the... It's, uh, um, uh, so like it was part part of it was that just being able to be like okay you you don't give a shit about me so now i can move on um and also the fact that like i i did think that i was alone and then there was like such a huge uh like for my family and my friends and just like the, the whole like social media world like just came out and i felt a lot of love you know yeah. um uh and I, it really did. I, yeah, I feel like it did help me. I, like I haven't, I've only had one sort of relapse since then. Um, and, and it was, it was very slight comparatively, you know, did you, like, did you like hurt the fuck out of your hand at some point? Oh no, I got in a motorcycle accident. Like, yeah. I remember. A year after that. But that didn't, that wasn't part of the, of the sort of slot backslide. Um, not really, because, uh, um, you know, that it was a serious motorcycle accident, uh, like, a, you know, like almost a year after the, my attempt. And then, and they were going to amputate. And, and I was like, kind of, I con- sort of convinced the doctors to like, take a chance. And I'll be like, why don't we try to like fix it and then, and then decide whether to amputate and make, and they just, and so anyway, like after a, like 12 surgeries and a, a bunch of 
you know, months in the hospital and stuff, like I did save my leg, but I was in a wheelchair for two years afterwards um, and had no money, you know, but then the settlement from the accident came through finally. And um, yeah, and but the, even like the whole time I was in the wheelchair, you'd think that I would go back into this depression. Like I never, I never felt depressed about it. Like, cause I knew it was temporary. I mean, if I, if I had known that I was going to be in the wheelchair and that was it, like that was my life from then on, mm-hmm. uh, it would be a different story. I don't know how people, I, I really have a lot of respect for people that can, uh, stay positive in that, in that setting. Cause, yeah. uh, like yeah. I, so I, I, like, I guess because I saw it as a temporary thing, it's almost, I just, I was just like, I just have to ride it out, you know, like I have to make time speed up somehow. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I'm treating the whole COVID thing. It's like, it, like I went through two years in the wheelchair of total isolation again, mm-hmm. like that was, so this is sort of no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, um, uh, like I feel like it prepared me for this in some ways. Are you living alone? I am, yeah. But you're seeing your kids. Yeah, the kids are here like every other weekend. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So it's, but most of the time it's just me. But like, especially with this pandemic, I feel like I've been really busy, um, which is which is great. Like, yeah, I've been sort of following some of your streaming performances, like. There was a, a couple of duets and then the hideout thing and t- tell me right tell me about that like how is that just something you're setting up on your own or how's that all happening? Uh, man, that I think it was part of like I, uh, just sort of a, a rekindling of my friendship with Will Will Oldham. Like um, he's always supported me singing and he's I, I I didn't realize how much his encouragement means to me, to me and like gives me confidence to sing because I enjoy singing but I never thought I was a good singer. I just enjoy it, you know? Um, uh, and it, and I guess I sort of justified it because my favorite singers aren't really like good, considered good singers like Marky Smith or, um, Lou Reed or or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I kind of like the singers that aren't, um, what is it? American Idol or like they don't have all the chops and stuff. Yeah. I kind of like the ones that just get by on their personality, like Jonathan Richmond or somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, Will Oldham for sure. Yeah. And Will like, um, but he also has the, his, like he's like a master of words. So he's got that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it's been, so, and we started, we did the duet and um, I think it just got, like my voice changed after my attempt. Um, uh, it's, it's now like really, it sounds really like whiskey soaked and stuff yeah, <laughs> and yeah. gravelly and all that. And, and I just, I, I just had no range. Like I didn't have much range before. And now I was like, I can't sing at all. And so I just decided, you know, I, I figured I would just not, that was it for singing. Um, uh, but Will's been encouraging and Matt Sweeney's been encouraging. So, um, so now I've been trying to do it more, just force myself to sing a little bit every day. Um, and it's been fun, you know, like I, uh, and it's, I, now I have time to do stuff like this. Uh, and it's, it feels like less of a commitment if I can just put it on Instagram and cause you know, like maybe after the pandemic's over, I can delete them all, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's not like a record where, right. It's out there forever. Uh, yeah. I feel like it's, so it kind of, um, it kind of feels, uh, yeah, just really comfortable to me and, and people and the people that appreciate it, like, um, you know, if, if it weren't, if I didn't get like positive feedback, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even post them. I just, record it for myself or whatever but sure. it seems like other people seem to enjoy yeah enjoy it so um there's a um uh you did one of my favorites marty robbins did that um cool water tune oh uh, right yeah and i was man, if, um people who are listening to this if you're a fan of the sort of story song western style there's a great cover of um I can't remember who did that originally. Cool Water. I, I know Marty Robbins covered it. I think the guy's name was Nolan something. Dan, Ron Nolan, Dan Nolan. This uh, um, song was written in the 40s. And then 
tons of people covered it. Yeah, man, that, there was the like, like almost like a Texas swing style that was the famous version back then. I and I, for, I just spaced out on the name of that troupe of musicians that did it. Um, fuck. But I just, I just know the Hank Williams version the best, and yeah. so that kind of based mine on his. That's a great tune. Yeah, and I, yeah. Thank you. And I, I just like doing songs like that. What are you doing to, um, like, uh, do you meditate or do yoga or are you exercise or how are you sort of keeping a lid on some of that negative stuff or is it just uh, staying busy with music that's kind of kept it in in check? Man, uh, I I know a lot of people aren't into. Uh, western medicine um but like i you know, when after my attempt they put me on a medication that actually worked for me and like i've tried different medications antidepressants over the years and there's always something like side effects or um like or it would dampen my enthusiasm or something you know like uh this i'm like there's i can't remember what it was look so there was one medication I was on that like, I, I still felt all the same things. I just couldn't be bothered to act on anything. Like, but it, to me, it just seemed like that's just so numbing, you know, like yeah. it does, um, it didn't change anything in my brain, you know, like I still felt all the same horrible things. Um, but the, um, but it seemed like, uh, they put me on a medication that agreed with me and actually made me feel better. So I've been, that's helped a lot. Like I still take that every day. Which one is it? It's uh, it's called Delox. Oh, it's con- Concerta. Basically, it's like Deloxetine yeah. name. And I mean, if Thor Harris could take antidepressants, then I can fucking knuckle up and do it. Do you know Thor? Uh, no, I don't. No, oh, he's a, he was a former member of the Swans. He's this like oh yeah yeah it's fucking caveman dude. I love him. He's just like the most macho guy I've ever met in my entire life, but also one of the kindest and most gentle human beings ever. And he's real forthcoming about his, um, whole med regimen and all that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, if it, if it works for you, like, like I, I just sort of accepted that like, I'm, if, if this is working and it's not, uh, and I can't feel any, I can't tell any side effects are happening. Like, uh, I, I'm happy to take this for the rest of my life and, and just, and not have to go through that stuff anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I'm no problem with, um, you know, having this be like a, a lifetime drug for me, you know, cause it, it is chemical. Like a lot of this stuff, it is just like a chemical imbalance. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's how, but I do meditate and I do like exercise every day. And, um, and yeah, I guess now, now I'm back into music again too. Like that whole depression, that whole time I wasn't, I had zero interest in music. Like I, if I didn't want to pick up the guitar for the first time in my life, because I was like, I'm just going to play the same old shit. Like I know exactly what I'm going to play when I pick it up. Like, why bother? That's such a terrible feeling when you get caught yeah. in that like that that rat maze of of not being able to break out of your old patterns of playing. And I feel like I, you know I'm gonna try to get out of my patterns. Patterns like I'm gonna try to detune it, and then I'll try to think of a new chord that I you know like I everything mm-hmm. seemed so predictable. I was just so uninterested, and then like you know like gradually after my attempt, like I started getting back into music and excited about it again. I still don't listen to much music, um, almost nothing actually. But, um, but I, I love, I play guitar every day now at least. Yeah. Man, I usually wind these things up with a series of ten questions that um, are very, very loosely based on the questions at the end of Inside the Actor Studio. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, yeah, everybody's kind of heard those questions and they've got answers kind of pre sort of pre-planned so I, I kind of came up with 10 of my own but it's kind of the same thing if, if you're up for that we can jump in sure all right yeah first question what is the fondest memory you have of a meal that you've had my fondest memory of a meal um geez i uh pussy <laughs> 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 uh that's on it. That, that's the only honest answer I can say. Because I, I have sort of a, a utilitarian out, 
like I'm so not a foodie. Like, right. I, to me, it's just fuel. Like I, I just like I have, you have to gas up now, you know. So I'll eat something. <laughs> but like, I don't have any. I can't, it's sort of sad, but I don't have any fond memories of food. Yeah, Thor. We just talked about Thor. Thor is the same way. He was like, man, I, I resent meal time. It's inconvenient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this time it's like filling up with gas for me yeah and, and that's it yeah yeah <laughs> um what is the most frightened you've ever been the most frightened yeah um ah uh, gosh i think it was i mean uh i mean it sounds i mean it's basically what we were talking about like that moment when i jumped like i uh yeah, I just, um, I was definitely scared and uh, didn't know what to expect other than, you know, I just, I didn't know, like, is this going to hurt or is this going to be, uh, what's going to happen? You know, I, I didn't, it was, it was definitely the most frightened that, you know, that moment right before I jumped, but I just knew it had to be done. It was like now or never kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that would, it would have to be that time. I was, you know, I was I was actually turning off my phone, um, and then I saw a cop car uh, in front of me, and I was like I was like oh oh fuck you know like the cops are here like I'm so screwed, and then um, and then all of a sudden the spotlight was on me and there and there was a cop that had gone down the one way street the opposite way, and like snuck up behind me basically, and so I was just like I'm doing it now I like threw my phone and. Um, and jumped and and it was just like a, just everything just went black that's all for me it was like a, and it's it stayed like that for a while what is the thing in your life that you've lost that you regret losing the most oh uh, um and so it's yeah i mean regret questions are hard because i don't um, I think I spent a lot of eff uh, mental effort trying not to regret anything, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, uh, thing that I've lost, um, gosh, there's, uh, I don't know. I feel like losing things is just part of <laughs> like aging and part of being alive. And yeah. like things are just going to fall to the wayside, and especially us. Like we're at the age now where people are starting to die right and left. Well, you've, you've had a year of one loss after another because two members of, of your, your most recent band died this year. Um, that's right. Lauren K. Newman, who I thought was maybe the greatest, uh, like drummer I've ever seen. Oh uh, yeah. Astonishing. Oh, so you got to see her play. Yeah. Well, she was from Pensacola oh, before she moved to Portland, and I had s s seen her at some point, in, you know, before she moved out west, and was just like, "Holy shit!" And then people were like, yeah. "She's an even better guitar player," and I was like, "What?" Yeah, that's what they said to me too. And she is a great good, or she was a great guitar player as well. But man, she—I think the drums were were like seeing her behind a kit was just mind blowing because she was such a a tiny petite person and then just like raging behind the kit, like mm -hmm. Bonham style. Yeah. Thunderous. Um, for someone with such a small physical form, she knew how to like, there's a way as a drummer to crack the, like get that whip crack action to make things louder. And yeah, and she fucking had that. Like she was unbelievable musician. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, Vern, like, yeah, like two out of four members of this uh, band. I mean, I don't even know if we were a band. We just kind of got together and had fun in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and, but like, we all liked each other. You know, we all bonded big time. And then, yeah, like two are gone now. Like when, when I heard about Vern, I was, I, I was like, this is like a bad joke, but when I was texting with Conan, I was like, man, which one of us is next now? You know, like, you know, this seems really ominous. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I feel like that's the kind of joke that Vern and Lauren would have laughed at. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, tell me about a time you received an act of kindness from a stranger. 
Oh man. I, um, you know, I feel like, uh, well, after my attempt, I had nothing but kindness from strangers. And then, and then when I was in the wheelchair, I became really aware of anybody that showed any, uh, sort of, uh, that like just helped when I was in public with my, in the wheelchair, you know, um, like, like Jay Steven holding the door open or something is huge. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff is a big deal. Or if somebody just came to visit me, you know, um, uh, like, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it was just, um, you know, and there, there's a, you'd be surprised how many people don't like, you know, help a guy out that's in a wheelchair or like hold the door for him, let it fall on him. And it might be a heavy door. Uh, you know, like that kind of stuff is, um, it seems like small when you do it for people, like just holding a door for somebody, but like the, uh, you know, like an elderly person or something, but to them, it's a big deal. So like, um, I think that, I think, I think it's happened a lot, uh, in like the last five years for me. Yeah. Strangers have been very kind. Yeah. What's your favorite place to gig? Oh gosh. Uh, man, um, I always liked playing in Baltimore. I was just thinking about that. Like, have, have you ever, have you played in Baltimore, right? Like a million years ago. Did, did you ever play um, at the auto bar in Baltimore? No. Did that ring up? No. Oh, uh, it was just this little kind of divey bar that was run by like people like us. And it was just always, it was always fun there. It was always weird because I don't think people realize that um, uh, the Appalachian Trail goes, you know, a, like a really far north all the way to Maryland. And uh, there's a lot of, there's like an Appalachian sort of part of Baltimore <laughs> that's really, and uh, Auto Bar was kind of in that in that area. So it was always like a weird scene. Um, and it was, I mean, I guess it's, it was more fun when I was like, you know, single and drinking and smoking yeah. weed. And <laughs> but yeah. it was, uh, I always, I always liked playing in Baltimore. Like there's, there's good people there for sure. And I guess for like, gigging like anywhere in Asia is always fun. Like, um, uh, to me, like, like playing in Japan or, uh, uh, um, Malaysia or Indonesia or anywhere. It's like, like in Asia is always like exciting to me. Uh, we went to India, uh, with five, eight, a couple of years ago. Wow. And, and I was like, man, I could fucking do this. It would be, India was badass. Uh, yeah, but I haven't been to Japan or Singapore or anything. Um, uh, visa and income considerations aside, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Man, I, uh, I've thought about that a lot and, and I've considered living in different countries and stuff, but I always, I, I feel like I'm just more comfortable in America. Um, <laughs> and, uh, just, and, and I do like where I live right now. I mean, I like being in southern california right now just because it's still like uh kind of a novelty to me and an exotic feeling you know like just seeing palm trees is the weird uh you know I, even now i'm blown away when i see the palm trees in my backyard you know yeah like because i feel like i'm i pretend at least that i'm on some like exotic island or something because <laughs> i you know i grew up in Ken kentucky it's like the bluegrass and we we have some rolling hills but we don't have mountains and no. stuff, you know, like this, not like this. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this still, um, I, I guess like, I like, you know, but I had thought like I could, cause I love Iceland. I love, uh, the South of France, you know, there's all kinds of places I would like to live, but I feel like there's enough, um, as far as comfort, like I just always, I'm always like, I, I feel like America is just, where I'm going to be comfortable the most, you know, I just, I just know it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a lame. No, nah, it's not lame at all. Um, my friends think I'm crazy cause I get these cravings for Southern California. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I had, before I spent much time out here, I, I was very judgmental about <laughs> Southern California or just wow. California. And like, it's, uh, it's still true. Like the same things still annoy me about, like LA and stuff like the, the fakeness and the, um, 
you know, the vanity and the, uh, all that shit is still ever present, you know, but, um, but there's a, enough stuff that I, I, um, to kind of where I, I don't overlook that stuff. Like I still see it and it bothers me, but, um, uh, it kind of, because, because there's so much fakeness here, like it makes me feel so authentic, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> gives me a feeling of authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think about L.A. is that like once you get past the entertainment industry, there's a deep like century old culture there that was there before the film industry. Oh, yeah. There was like a whole post-war boom where lots of African-American guys moved out there because they wanted to get away from the South and all the racism. And there's a huge Latino community there. And like and just like I could spend a month just like, you know eating around uh in koreatown you know like i i, I totally. just I, I just the light there i'm absolutely bewitched by the light like there's something about sunlight filtering through that many layers of particulate matter from all the smog that like it's just like living on a film set it's so weirdly lit and i i i just man i i love it i was about to say the same thing like about like the light is is different here than it is anywhere else in America. And the same with New York. I feel like the, when the sun, like a New York summer and, or like just the sunlight in New York is, is unique. And, um, but like, I get that feeling in, in this part of the world too. Like, uh, it's, I, I, I didn't think about it as being related to the small, like I, I just assumed it had something to do, to do with the ocean more. Um, and I'm not used to living near an ocean. Like i I grew up in like like the exact center of the, the most landlocked you could possibly be. Right, right. So it's like, um, so yeah, all of it still feels really like foreign and alien and in a good way to me. Yeah. yeah. So I like it here a lot. Um, and and you know, like I always felt like the LA that there was like for all the fashion kind of BS that uh, happens, just sort of in the name city really uh like there there was always a, a below the radar music scene in la that was really cool i felt like um always there's always has been and, and it's it's sort of like just finding it that can be the tricky part sometimes like there, but there is stuff happening that's really cool that's not like uh taken over by the cool kids or whatever yeah do you have a perfect musical instrument um and if so do you already own it or not um, no, I don't actually. I, uh, I just have a lot of imperfect ones. <laughs> I, have <Yeah>. play, <laughs> I have to figure out the, the idiosyncrasies and try to play around. them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is there like a dream guitar or, um, uh, I, I guess I, the, there might be on a different day. Like, um, right now, just anything with strings is exciting to me. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah, I guess I'm not, um, uh, yeah, I'm not super, I, I love a nice guitar for sure, but I, I guess I'm so used to, um, uh, you know, just, just like anything that makes sound like kind of work, yeah. like working with, I like, I like the, the punk rock idea of, you know, like they couldn't, you know, they couldn't afford the best instruments or whatever, but they, they came up with their own sound you know, just, I kind of like the idea of working within your limitations. Um, uh, you know, like you might have a shitty guitar and amp, but that could be the reason why your band sounds different from everybody else. You know, that's true. You can make your weaknesses work for you. And I feel like that's what a lot of punk bands do, you know? Yeah. And even though I don't listen really to any punk like anymore, or I, but I mean, not much, uh, it's, I guess that there's those kind of attitudes of like making the most of what you have or making a, a weakness become a strength kind of thing. Um, like I still have, I, those are the kind of lingering attitudes that I still have. Yeah. Is there an instrument that you've lost because it was stolen or lost or you had a pawn at or something that you desperately wish you could get back? Gosh, there's, um, I lost a lot of good recording gear, uh, but it was, because um, I had a, the house that I owned in Louisville had a, a flooding basement problem. And I came back from tour and like, to like six inches of water in my basement, like floating guitars and like, oh. I, but I had, um, 
So everything got water damaged, but I had these two microphone preamps that were taken out of uh, an Ampex 351, like, like two track machine. Mm -hmm. And they, it was just like had a billion tubes in it. And they, I got them for really cheap because it was, I got them at a time when, um, I guess people were getting rid of their tube stuff to buy digital things. Yeah. And, and I, I just got them cause they were cheap. I didn't realize that they were like collectible or, or good. Um, but it seemed like everything I would record with that just had sounded beautiful. Uh, and it sounded almost like, like tape, even though I was recording the pro tools. Um, and those got fucked up and like water damaged and, um, I, I wish I still had those. <laughs> like that's it's much like I guess I'm less I'm not as precious about instruments. Like I could I feel like I could instruments are kind of replaceable. Um I uh but but like the cuz I can set up an instrument the way I like it yeah. or a guitar or whatever. Um but but those preamps I don't like I could buy them again but they would they would just cost it more i don't know that's the sort of punk rock thing like you buy cheap and fix things and like and the idea that you would go out and spend four thousand dollars on a stereo pair of preamps just feels like to me ridiculously extravagant yeah yeah exactly yeah i mean that's the thing is like um after like pre-nirvana like those like those fender jags and stuff weren't wanted you know they were, you'd see them in pawn shops because uh, everyone wanted the bc rich or the the you know in the 80s like everyone wanted the the rocket gu guitars with floyd rose systems and um so those fenders were considered really old-fashioned and cheap guitars and then after nirvana all the fenders like all that stuff became really valuable and uh like i i was lucky i bought like a, a an old fender precision bass for uh, it's a 1962 one and I bought it for like 300 bucks and it's so beat up and so cool. You know, yeah. um, it would, it would only been played by a gospel band like every Sunday and it was so worn out. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it was, it's what I played in, in, um, tortoise and it actually like, uh, there was, it wasn't, they featured it in a guitar magazine. Like they, borrowed it and took photos of it and it was like the center falls or whatever because uh, it was such a cool guitar but like i remember i got that before the nirvana happened and after that like all that stuff became really expensive so i just sort of lucked out that i got it um before before it all became valuable again yeah uh, but yeah you know what i i think that bass is probably one that i would feel i would feel really bad if anything happened to it if i didn't have it anymore do you play flats or rounds on it um, I play, I, I don't play flat rounds. I play, yeah, just regular. Yeah. I love flat rounds on a P bass, but it's not appropriate for everything. Yeah. I think, you know, um, cause I used it mostly with, with tortoise and, uh, Doug McCombs, the other bass player. He's more of a, he's like a real bass player. He plays a Fender jazz and he has, he plays with his fingers and he's got such a deep bass tone to it. Like everything's super big and warm. And I, I played it bass more like a guitar so i wanted i wanted it to sound more um like not thin but like uh sort of have a trebly or a mid-rangey kind of sound to it and play chords on it and play it more like a guitar you know so it could, would contrast his sound mm -hmm. um uh so i think that's i love the way flat round feels but um i think that's why i i didn't change it because i didn't want it to be too smooth sounding yeah. <laughs> Um, if you could be a guest artist with any performer and play one song, who would it be and what would the song be? Oh, man, I would love to. Um, I guess my dream is to be in Billie Eilish's band. That would be a dream come true. I think she played tonight at the Democratic National Convention. Oh, did she? Yeah. Fuck. I, I, was, I was doing other stuff. but Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll watch I think she's um, I like, I love her voice and her songs. I love her whole vibe and I can't, yeah. Like if I could play guitar or anything, you know, I'll play, um, you know, <laughs> I'll play spoons or <laughs> for her band. <laughs> is there, is there a particular song? Uh, that I would want to play with her? Yeah. Uh, gosh, it would be, um, this is super, 
it would be fun to play a Madonna song with her, oh, um, like maybe one of the early ones. Yeah, uh, but it would be pretty silly. But you know, I would. I just really, I, I it's so funny. Like in the early '90s, my two favorite current bands were Tortoise and Stereo Lab, and now in t- 2020, it's my favorite current band is Billy Eilish. <laughs> um, Last question: um, If you could imagine a taxi that can go anywhere in time or any place. Uh, and you got into this taxi and you said to the driver, hey man, uh, take me home. Where is home? And it could be any time period. Sure. Um, mm, so I could go back in time too? Yeah. Uh, uh, gosh, I think I mean, I think we're, I mean, a part of me wants to say I would, I would go past the pandemics where I just sort of fast forward through all this part yeah. <laughs> and past. Um, but I, I, I don't, um, I guess I'm not like a, like I'm trying not to exist in the past or future, you know? So I guess it would, be really boring and it'd be like i'd be like i would i would just be now and i would and home would be where i'm at right now yeah you know you're not the first person to say right here right now in the answer to that question yeah i i mean it's it's just hard to it's hard for me to um to, to think like that because i put so much effort into tr- uh trying to stay in the present you know yeah. Um, uh, that's another thing. Like, just uh, like real quick, um, as far as like mental health, I feel like another big thing for me has been to, um, yeah, just you know, the whole sort of hippie idea of staying in the present, like, um, is is true. Like, there, like, to me, the mo- it, like everything happens in the moment, like. Uh, it's just the moment's really long, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the eternal moment. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like just, you know, staying in the moment's important and realizing that, like, whatever happened in the past is not happening right now, like, unless you bring it here, you know? And whatever's going to happen in the future is not is not right here. Like, so, and, like, like right now I'm sitting in my couch, my, my cat's um, asleep on my lap, it's pretty fucking cozy right now, you know, yeah, yeah. like I could be, I could be in a state of dread, but, uh, if I'm in the moment, like I have nothing, but I have nothing to complain about right now. You know, like I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I, yeah, I have nothing to complain about. Like I'm alive. My kids are doing great. I, you know, my cat's so comfortable, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I, uh, I could probably find a lot of things to complain about, but, the truth is, you know, in this moment, I'm safe and I'm healthy and I'm happy. And uh, there's that. And there's also like once you're in the moment is try to use the moment to sort of get thanks for things like rather than think about all the shitty things that have happened to you or all the shitty things that are around the corner. Like just um, try to just try to focus on gratitude. And that helps me a lot. Like um, I like I just uh, got severely dumped, you know, in the relationship and that's, you know, ghosted big time. And, and that was really hard for me because it happened like right before the pandemic. And, uh, because I was, I was in love, like for the first time since, you know, since my divorce. And, um, and so to get ghosted was really hard. And, uh, but, but like staying in the moment and trying to, and focus on, uh, just, all the things I'm thankful for, um, as cheesy as it sounds, you know, like I, uh, I, I'm actually, I, I just, I, I can't be mad at her. Or I can't as much as I'd like to hate her and just move on, you know, like I, I just can't. And I, and I'm actually just really thankful about the time that we did have together and I'm fine with the way things are now, you know, like they're, um, uh, you know, I, I really, have nothing to complain about like it's um yet i will complain (laughs) (laughs) 
I'll, I'll, I'll complain anyway, but I, I know in the back of my mind that everything's cool. You know, like that's, that's actually the prevalent thought. It's almost like I'm, I'm acting human by complaining about stuff. Like I, I, I'm sort of, it's, I'm not that serious about the things I complain about. Yeah. Um, A friend of mine says that anxiety is trying to control the future and guilt is trying to control the past. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's, I can totally see that. (laughs) It's, I mean, and it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to just, uh, cause you know, the, I think the human desire is always to be moving forward and be moving to the next thing and always thinking about the next thing. And, the, you know, I wish I had more money. I wish I had more success. And I wish I had more this and that, and, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's, a, it, it's kind of a good exercise, you know, just to stay. stay. I, and I know now it's called mindfulness, but, you know, when I was younger and I would do this stuff, it was... It was just called staying in the moment, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's helped me a lot. If, if 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 anyone is struggling and listening to this, to good practice. Yeah. Well, man, the reason I asked you um, if you were nervous playing for Tortoise or Stereo Lab is because, um, you know, there was a band that I heard when I was sixteen that just turned everything for me on its ear. Like I walked into the record store at ACDC, Molly Hatchet, 38 Special Fan, and heard the Psychedelic Furs for the first time being played in the record store, like when the record Talk, Talk, Talk came out, and it blew my fucking mind. And I walked out a different human being, and then yeah, 2007, I got a call to be the drummer for that tour, the Psychedelic Furs North American tour. No way. And I could barely fucking breathe, like walking yeah. in that room. Like, you know, like I, I, yeah. I, I don't know if you ever seen like a relief pitcher come in in the like eleventh inning and just start throwing balls into the backstop because he's fucking got the yips. Like I had the yips. Like it took me like a week to settle into that gig. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, see, that's different. Like I, that's um, like I felt like I was amongst peers, you know, and colleagues. But like with. With that, that would be like, uh, you know, I don't know. Not that, not that my friends aren't legends to me, but that's that would be like if Bob Dylan asked me to play in his band or something. You know, like I, that's that's like another level to play in the psychedelic first. Yeah, I mean, but after like a fucking after a couple of weeks, you know, like it's just another band that you're in. Although the crowds were bigger than I'd ever played for. Like we played in Buffalo for fifteen thousand people, and I once again Whoa. couldn't breathe like got out on stage because we couldn't see the crowd because it was an outdoor festival and we were on a bus and we came off the bus and there was like a hockey team there the literal buffalo hockey team forming a like a v like a wedge through the crowd and we walked through the crowd in this v and we got to the stage and the <laughs> hockey team peeled off and i walked up on this metal superstructure you know the kind of thing they do for festivals and yeah and and I couldn't see the back of the crowd. It was so far away and like a little, little piss just kind of jumped out of my body. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. was, it was something else, man. But, um, that was yeah. a wild yeah. tour. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. This has been such a, um, such a pleasure. Oh gosh. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I really love, your podcast and just, and the whole concept behind it too. Like when Brad told me about it, I was like, well, yeah, I was born for this podcast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Mental health music. Yeah. I'm all over that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, so man. this has been great. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, you're doing this. Well, thanks man. I, I'm, I'll, I'm really grateful. All right, David Paho, man, what a survivor. I'm really, really glad he's still with us. Super grateful for that and super glad he was able to talk to us. If you want to check out his Instagram, you can pretty much get daily updates on him. It's at Say Sa David Paho, and that's like the French spelling C E S T C A D A V I D P A J O. Say Sa David Paho. You can 
follow him there and and he's constantly putting up song snippets and stuff and then you can see me say incredibly witty things in the comments like oh that's really cool david you're cool um i'm just i'm done pretending to be cool about people who do music that i love so anyway join us there be part of that conversation (laughs) i want to thank jake Kreger. he's the de facto producer of the show Uh, he was the first guest ever on the show and ever since then he's kept me between the lines he's constantly sending me show notes to help me make the show better he maintains the youtube channel and keeps it updated and he's a hard-working super smart guy who makes the show better if it's better now than that was the first time you heard it then that's all thanks to jake and speaking of people who do music that i love i want to thank gene wolfolk and the band the powder room for all the music that you hear every week on crash and ride most of it's from their first album curtains which is available on their band camp at the powder room Dot bandcamp.com there's also one track that you hear from the album lucky which is the one that i was fortunate enough to play on uh all of that's at their bandcamp the powder room dot bandcamp.com i also want to mention uh i found out tonight that bubba mcdonald the incredible bass player from the powder room the man the myth the mountain uh he's going to be a daddy i just found out tonight it's not going to be very long either so he and his beautiful wife are about to have a baby and I couldn't be more stoked for them and excited. They're going to be such great parents. Congratulations, y'all. I mean, amazing. I'm all emotional now. <laughs> I also want to mention that Gene Wolfolk and Erica Strout from the band Motherfucker have teamed up for a, a new partnership, a new musical partnership called Dream Tent. You can check out Dream Tent at D-R-E-A-M-T-E-N-T dot bandcamp dot com. It's more uh, of a sort of 80s synth wave shoegaze. Uh, it's really like nothing I've ever heard. I think it's really remarkable, and I think you should go check it out. Any band that you check out on Bandcamp, buy the music, because that's how we're all buying beans and bread right now. So go there and download some tracks and pay for them and help keep music alive, because we're all just hanging by a thread here. And lastly, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for being a part of this. I want to thank you for being a part of the Crash and Ride community. You can always reach out to me at Crash and Ride at ProtonMail.com. If you want to be a guest, if you know someone who should be a guest, just let me know. Crash and ride at protonmail.com. That account is private. It's encrypted. Nobody reads it but me. I will protect your anonymity at all costs unless you give me express permission to talk about you on the air. I will never do it. So crash and ride at protonmail.com. So until we speak again, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Ask for help if you need it. Go see live music if you can find a way to do it safely. Support your favorite band. And remember, loud guitars save lives. Mm